All right, hello everybody, and welcome to the last Inside Out of the semester. Very sad, but don't worry, Lee and I have new ideas that we're cooking up as we speak. Uh, and we're ending with a flourish with uh, Hilary Rosner. We're very pleased that she's here. She came a long way uh, to be with us and left her two-year-old at home, which has its pluses and minuses, Alone. I guess. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> Very independent two-year-old. There are a lot uh, of dogs, aren't there? I mean. <laughs> yeah, the dog's home, too. Uh, so, Hillary, thank you very much. And uh, Lee will formally introduce Hillary. But I just wanted to say that as a person who's written a few environmental stories in my time, I have uh, read Hillary's stories from all over the world for many years now. And she's quite good at it. Uh, she brings uh, a really nice combination of intellectual heft, but also kind of a, a stylish verve to her, her writing. And it's, it's a wonderful model for the students. So when Lee suggested her, I thought, yep, that's a great idea. So we're thrilled that you're here. And uh, with that, I will introduce Robert Lee Holtz, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute of Journalism and the science writer for the Wall Street Journal and our host for these Inside Outs. It's all yours, Lee. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are here uh, to turn science journalism inside out, hence the title of this evening series. What we're really doing is a, an act of forensic journalism. Uh, we are going to turn you inside out uh, kindly and with considerable gentleness, and uh, we're going to sort of find the loose threads, tug on them, and see uh, what is revealed. So here we are. We are at the intersection of words and form and technique and media and technology and the story of science in the environment. It's our aim with your help to uh, dissect this writer's work, to seek clues to her state of mind, uh, her reporting techniques and her writing practices, all in the cause of improving our own work and our own craft. Uh, but we do need your help. Um, this is not a lecture. This is indeed a conversation. Um, we ask you to interrupt, to help us digress. Uh, but please first do get the microphone from uh, Dan over there so that you can be part of the record that we're creating of, of the evening's conversation. So every one of us uh, who's engaged in this comes to this craft in a slightly different way in the course of different pursuits. Um, and here, as Dan says, at the last of these sessions for this semester, it seems like a good thing to reacquaint ourselves with some of the reasons why we write and why especially we've taken up science as the subject of our reporting. Do we write to educate? Do we write to inform? Do we write to pay the rent? Do we write to get out of the house? How far will we go for a story, and what will we sacrifice in pursuit of it? So our guest this evening, environmental writer Hilary Rosner, comes to us from Colorado. We thank you for coming quite so far to engage with us this evening. Thanks for having me. She's a backpack journalist of some merit who has helped set the standard for modern conservation writing. Uh, she's an adventurous field reporter and an energetic and committed and unrepentant freelancer. Uh, you have seen her work featured in almost every publication of any significance, National Geographic, Wired, New York Times, Scientific American, Discover, Mother Jones, Popular Science, High Country News, Men's Journal, I'm starting to run out of breath, on Earth, Audubon, Slate, uh, Grist. Her works won awards from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, two from AAAS, in fact, um, the Society for Environmental Journalists, and the National Association of Science Writers. She's contributed to six books, including uh, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, she works these days in a studio made of straw bales in Colorado. But she grew up here in New York on the Upper East Side as the product of what, in respect to her family that were here 
I'll just call a very Manhattan upbringing. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, she attended a middle school party chaperoned by Mick Jagger. Um, and I'm, I'm told she got ju junior <laughs> high school. Sure I never told you that. Um, no, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> okay, you're a really good reporter. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Um, <laughs> and I'm told um, that she got uh, junior high school sex tips from Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> um, but um, she, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen anyone blush in a long time. Um, she went to college at Wesleyan where she majored in American Studies. She has an MFA in Creative Writing from New York University. Uh, she has an MA in uh, Environmental Studies from the University of Colorado. Uh, she was an MIT Knight Fellow and a Fellow of the Alicia Patterson Foundation. And I've given you a chance to kind of recover your grave you. professional face there. Um, but the most important thing you need to know about Hillary as a science journalist is that she's never hesitated to quit a good job to pursue her work as an independent journalist. Um, her reporting has taken her around the globe from Borneo to Nicaragua, Iceland to Ethiopia, and as I say, she flew uh, you know, several thousand miles to be with us here this evening. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to do is begin our conversation this evening at, at, at a point where we all, I think all of us here this evening have in common as journalists which is rejection. Um, I wonder, before we get into some of your thoughts on craft and contracts and field reporting and whatever, um, you were nice enough to bring a folder of um, your first round of job applications, maybe your second and third round of job applications, um, and the rejection letters yeah. that she got. And, and just to kind of get this evening off to the right start, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading us one or two. I would be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice I'm dating myself because these are all actually, I didn't print these out. These are things that were actually right, that's paper a good point. came to me in envelopes. Yeah. Um, so, and those yeah. things in the corner, they're called what, stamps? Is that the right <laughs> word? I think they're called stamps, yeah. Um, yes, I have quite a lot of rejection letters. Um, I'm an expert in rejection. I think it's always good to be an expert in something. Um, I tried very hard uh, while I was um, my I, while I was a senior in college and after graduation. I tried very very hard to get a job as an editorial assistant at a magazine, uh, and I got nothing but an enormous pile of rejection letters, which actually continued for several years. Um, I never actually got a job as an editorial assistant at a magazine. Um, so yes, uh, this is from Esquire. Uh, Thank you for your letter and resume. There are no full-time entry-level editorial openings here at the moment. However, I've given a copy of your resume to our research editor, so the opportunity for freelance fact-checking arrived. I never heard from them. Um, here's Spy Magazine. Ha, ha, ha. They don't exist anymore. It's probably because they rejected me. That'll show them. Um, thank you for your interest in Spy. Regrettably, we have no openings with the magazine at this time. I will, however, keep your resume on file in the event that something should come up. Uh-huh. Um, here's one from Time Out New York. Thank you very much for your recent correspondence. Your qualifications are certainly impressive, and I can see why Time Out appeals to you. <laughs> However, our few staff positions probably aren't quite right for a person with your skills and experience. Please feel free to contact us about freelance writing once publication begins in the fall. Till then. Anyway. And so, <laughs> you're there are a here. lot of these. You're here. Somehow, I don't want to count just how many of those are. Sure. Somehow, that that uh, that barrage of rejection um, did not daunt you. Um, um, so there you are. You're unemployed. Uh, you are in New York. Mm -hmm. You are what? Twenty. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Okay, New York. Twenty-two. Um, Oh, so let's just pick a number, $10,000 in student loans. Um, what do you do? <laughs> uh, well, I, um, I did some freelancing. Uh, I started doing a little bit of freelancing for the, um, God, I don't even know if these things exist anymore. There used to be all these free weekly neighborhood newspapers that were in these boxes on street corners. Do those still exist? 
Um, I did some writing for those for like 50 bucks a pop. Um, I kept sending out <laughs> query letters to um, try to get a job. I won't make you read anymore. I think we've established that. So. Um, and I uh, happened to go to a bar one night and bump into a friend of mine from high school who had graduated from college a year ahead of me, and actually two friends of mine, and they told me they were working at the New York Post. And I was like, oh my god, I'm so desperate to get a job in journalism. You know, and then they said, oh, well, as it turns out, I think they might be hiring a desk assistant. You know, call this person tomorrow. And so I did. <clears throat> I called this person the next day, and um, she was, it was her last week on the job. She was like the office manager, and it was her last week on the job, and she wanted to hire one more person on a freelance basis before she left. And so I just happened upon this sort of freelance swing shift job at the New York Post as a desk assistant just because I walked into the right bar at the right time. So, um, so that's what I did. So I started working at the New York Post. Um, sort of one, one night I was the overnight person and one night I worked at 7 a.m. and kind of all over the map. And then um, about a month or so into that, I actually got a call from the Village Voice where I had applied, I think I had applied twice for an internship. And finally they said, hey, we have an internship for you. So I... So you quit the New York Post. So I started doing both jobs. Both jobs. Um, and so for six months or a year, I can't remember exactly, I worked um, simultaneously at the New York Post and the Village Voice. And sometimes both in the same day, I would go to work at the Village Voice during the day, and then I would go to my job at the New York Post at night. I can't imagine and two like sort of more <laughs> extremes <laughs> of American journalism, if we... You know, then the New York Post in the morning and the Village Voice in the afternoon. I mean, did this cause any internal dislocations? It was a little bit. It was a little bit insane. Well, culturally, yeah, it, um, was, it was totally insane. But I did not go to journalism school, and so it was like this great immersion into journalism. And so, you know, at the Village Voice, I learned how to really sort of dig deep and do kind of investigative reporting and um, do longer stuff, and at the New York Post, I learned how to write on deadline and um, just kind of how a daily paper worked. And so I'm curious then, so there you are with your bag full of, or folder full of rejection letters. You are uh, grateful to be working as an editorial assistant at the New York Post and at the uh, Village Voice at the same time. Um, I mean, that has the makings of a situation comedy right there. <laughs> but. Um, you know, you don't have a background as a journalist. Um, you're not particularly, as a younger person, interested in science, um, as best I can tell. Um, so where did this impulse come from that led you to working for the Post in the morning and the Village Voice at night? And how did this come to be? Um. I was always, um, well, I was always a writer. So yeah. I, um, as a kid, I uh, had something called the Spy Club uh, with a couple friends. And we used to, I, I grew up in an apartment building, and we used to listen at the doors, doors of yes. all of our neighbors. And, and, um, and you took notes, yes? I took copious took notes. notes. I still have my oh. spy notebooks. They're full of just, you know, unbelievable scoops, like Mrs. Landy was doing her laundry. It's like riveting, <laughs> riveting <laughs> stuff. Um, and yeah, so we that that was kind of I think my that was my start, and after that, was that I start. was just after enough yeah. of that I was just hooked. It was yeah. just you know yeah. endlessly fascinating the things that people in an apartment building will do. <laughs> and has it stayed with you? You still have the notebooks, right? I still have the notebooks. You still have the notebooks. I, I did yeah. not bring them. Okay, all right. Well, it's a good thing because if I I'd make you read from them at this point. Um, no, but I'm I'm kind of interested because you are, if I may say, more than many. Uh, science journalists I know and have talked to, so very committed to kind of charting your own course. I mean, as a, you're, uh, I don't even want to call you a freelancer. I want to call you an independent Thank you. journalist. Um, and that's unusual. I mean, I think we tend to um, generically talk about freelancing as if it's a sort of burden and if you were really, the cards fell right, you'd have a, a more permanent gig somewhere and well, you can make it work, but it's a trial. And when I talk to you about freelancing, that's not what I hear. So I'm very curious about where this very strong-minded, um, uh, your, your uh, uh, sister in London would say bloody-minded, I think, um, a commitment to your own kind of journalism came from. Um, well, I mean, it's, I think 
as soon as I started working in journalism, I decided that I wanted to be a freelancer. Um, I think I always had this sort of innate fear of working in a cubicle, and I had this innate fear of having only two weeks vacation. <laughs> um, so that was kind of part of it. Uh, but I, I really always just wanted to be a, a freelancer. Like I just thought that that was the most incredibly glamorous, it turns out it's not actually glamorous at all, but I thought that it was this incredibly glamorous thing where you could like, you made your own hours and you made your own schedule and you weren't beholden to anyone and you just packed your bag and you went off in the world yeah. and you, you know, then you, you did all these exciting exotic things and then you came back and you like, you know, sat at a cafe and rode and then you like took a vacation or whatever while everyone else was at work. And I just thought this was like, the most amazing yeah, way yeah. to live. I just love the idea that you could somehow like build your own life and build your own career and you didn't have to just get up and go to work at a desk job every day. So tell us a little bit more about how you arrived at this because even if you started with this idea, um, you clearly um, thrashed around in the pit of gainful employment um, <laughs> for a while before you really sort of struck out. On um, your own. You mean the, the little trajectory? Yes, the little trajectory. So, so well, so I worked, so I, I simultaneously worked at the New York Post and the Village Voice. Right. And then um, I, that internship ended, and I got a full-time job at the New York Post, and so I was working there. So what were you doing at the New York Post? I mean, you, so weren't, I was a you weren't chasing the headless body in the topless I bar. I kind of so was. You were. So I was a you desk, doing, assist I was a desk assistant, yeah. but I had a car, and that made me very valuable. And so um, I was the one who was always, if there was, if everyone else was out on assignment and something happened, you know, I would, I would be the first of the desk assistants to get sent out somewhere. Um, and it was often to like the furthest reaches of the outer boroughs. I mean, I had lived in New York my whole life, but I right. learned more about New York City during that, those two years huh. at the Post than I, you know, did probably my whole life, just from kind of going out to these crazy places that I'd never been. Um, and I hated it, and it really, I was not cut out to be a daily reporter, um, and certainly not a daily news reporter like that, and I lived with this perpetual sort of sinking feeling in my stomach, like I'd wake up in the morning with this pit in my stomach going like, oh God, where are they going to send me today? Um, and then I also had one day on the features desk where I did ridiculous things like writing about like rollerblading around New York and just kind of silly puff pieces, um, which I actually preferred because then I didn't have to go out and write about a murder or suicide or something terrible. Uh, so I did that and then um, I just couldn't take, one day I just couldn't take it anymore. And I had saved up enough money, um, so I was living in a, a, an apartment with a roommate at the time and I'd saved up enough money to pay about three months of rent. So your cushion then was my cushion, cushion was, for independence was, was three, three months, months rent. Okay. Three months and, and very generous parents who were here. But, but yeah, I had saved up enough money to, to pay for three months of rent. And so my, I had to, I quit my job at the Post. One day I just decided I couldn't take it anymore and I quit. And I started sending off these letters to all these magazines again. Yeah. Which you'd had a such a good experience yeah, with the first time around. So well the first yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, Two and a half months or so passed, and right. I still did not have a job. Uh -huh. And I got um, an offer from this trade magazine, which was part of Ad Week, okay. um, to have a staff job there. And I kind of had no choice but to take it. Um, and I went into it thinking, this is so much worse than working for the New York Post was. Yeah, you're <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And why well, did I end up here? But. Um, but it actually turned out to be, it was one of those jobs where it, like, I was miserable every day. Um, right. But I, it actually turned out to be an incredible opportunity because I ended up writing about a lot about the internet and like the early days of e-commerce. So and, this would have been when? Oh my god. Uh, this must have been 1995 or 96. All right, last century. Yeah, <laughs> this is a, re a really long time ago. Okay. okay. Um, so I, so I, I ended up writing about all these Microsoft and AT&T mm -hmm. and all these companies that were doing stuff, and mm -hmm. and that ended up giving me this kind of little expertise in something, mm -hmm. um, and so I subsequently I couldn't take it anymore. I quit that job, and then I sort of cobbled together some freelance work. I started copy editing. Um, I did some freelance copy editing at the Nation and at the cobbled together. That's one of those words that <clears throat> usually is stretched across a ravine of like projection. So what, 
Well, so I, so I, um, let's see, a professor of mine, something together. a professor of mine from college, um, who I was close to, a sociology professor, his wife is a literary agent in New York, and okay. I, she, she, one of them called me up one day and said, oh, we need some help in the office, can you ah, come? Right. And actually what my, what my job was, so I went to work for this literary agency like two days a week, and my job was actually sending out the form rejection <laughs> letters. <laughs> And it was so depressing. I sat. <laughs> Did you come across your name? I'm just. A... <laughs> I forgot about this until just now. <laughs> this is like buried, like way deep down I somewhere. I can see why. I, uh, <laughs> I sat in this little back room, and they had. I mean, it was like a stack of these printed out, like uh -huh. photocopied uh -huh. rejection letters, like uh -huh. dear, you know, and you'd write in the person's name, uh -huh. like. Whatever, it was just the same thing as these letters that I have right here. Um, and did you sign and them? So it was did you job. sign them? Yeah, well, I signed the name of somebody at the end. Ah, you, so you forged somebody's signature. <laughs> but I was so, like, I, you know, there was just, I went through the slush pile and I would, like, pick it up and sort of look at it. And I just, you know, several times a day I would go in to one of the agents and say, are you, are you sure you don't want to just take a look at this? Like, this poor person has been slaving over this manuscript for, and they would say, we're a really small agency. We're just taking on, we're not taking on any new clients now. Like, it's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I did. So that was one thing that you know. Uh -huh, and then I ended up. Right. Um, I had had this internship at the Village Voice, so I had a lot of connections there. And so I ended up copy editing there. Um, and then through that kind of copy editing network, I got like I was a copy editor briefly at the Nation. And so. So those desk skills actually have are kind of a passport to uh, part-time employment. Yeah. So I sort of like I w I used the connections that I made and just kind mm -hmm. of cobbled together something mm -hmm. that could mm -hmm. pay the rent. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I actually started um, an MFA program here during that time. And then, because I was already at the Village Voice working there, um, a job came available and I ended up getting hired at the Village Voice. So I'm kind of a little confused. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Um, so you decide to take the MFA, go for an MFA. Yeah, I decided to go for an MFA. You Sorry. soured on like fact-based writing. <laughs> So I had Nonfiction always, has really not been anything but a source of <laughs> heartless rejection for you. I had always, in addition to listening to people's doors and writing down what they were doing, I had uh -huh. also always been interested in fiction. And uh -huh. I always wrote short stories my whole life. Uh -huh. And I'd always had this fantasy of um, doing an MFA program. I just, you know, along with my fantasy of being freelance writing, being glamorous, I thought like, oh, being in an MFA program was just the coolest thing ever. And so when I finally was didn't have a job and right. I had right. some time on my hands, I, I applied. And you still had student loans left over from the lab? No, I did nope. not have you student loans from college. I didn't have student loans from college. Oh, I'm I sorry. just had student loans from graduate school. Oh, well. um, so, yeah, so I'll I... talked to your parents. I, <laughs> I'm very grateful that I did not have student loans from college. Thanks, Dad. Um, so uh, I, I applied for MFA programs okay. um, and I happened to get into NYU somehow. And so I decided to do it. But, at, but very soon after deciding to do it, I ended up getting hired at the Village Voice full time. Okay, so you were So it was like this sort of strange a, thing. So I ended yeah. up doing those two things simultaneously also. Because uh -huh. I just like to do lots of weird well, things. Well, I'm sort at of getting a little time. thread here. It's just sort of like, okay, so the New York Post and the, and the Village Voice <laughs> at the same time, the Village Voice and the MFA some, at the same time. This is actually very good training for a freelancer. I guess so. Multitasking. Yeah. Multitasking, yeah. yeah. So your MFA. Now, I wonder what creative writing taught you about being a journalist. Um, it definitely, I think it was definitely useful. So I have not written a word of fiction since I turned in my thesis. Um, Is there a cause and effect there? Um, know about? <laughs> I just really was not, it's just not my thing. I'm not very good at it and I don't have any need to do it. But I think it taught me a lot about uh -huh. storytelling and narrative and characters and all these things that are actually very important when you're doing long form nonfiction writing. Can you give us an example? Uh, <laughs> you can, I'll skate along real fast. Um, I cannot think of a specific That's example. This is, <laughs> I do this as a test just to prove to you all this is not rehearsed. <laughs> you might have been deceived by that because we produced rejection letters on command. Um, so you. There you are, so you're working full time at the Village Voice, you're doing your MFA. What are you doing at the Voice? Um, so I, the job that I ended up getting to start with was in the listings department. So mm -hmm. I was a listings editor. I would type in you know, ridiculous 
listing information into the computer. And um, I was also writing website reviews. And because I had this expertise in internet-related stuff from this terrible job that I'd had before, uh, I sort of parlayed that into something in Bill Joyce. So I started writing um, website reviews. And then there was, um, a, there was an internet column that ran um, weekly, which is one page, one column, written by one person. And um, they eventually asked me to edit that. And then they decided they wanted to expand it and turn it into a whole section. So I was able to sort of parlay this whole thing into a job. I ultimately was, became a senior editor with responsibility for this section called Machine Age, which I created and edited every week. And you've got a full-time job at what that time the Village Voice was kind of in its, still in its glory. Um, yeah, slightly faded, but yes, well, that's, definitely nowhere near where it is today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. Um, but you're not satisfied with this. Well, I was satisfied really? for a while, yeah. um, but I... Um, on your way to becoming like a New York media figure. Right, I was on my way to becoming a New York... No, I was very... It was a great, it was a great opportunity, it was a great job, it was a great place to work. Um, I sort of... The way it worked there was like everybody sort of had their little fiefdom, so like the film editor mm -hmm. ran their own little fiefdom and had their own writers and um, the, you know, all the different editors just like did their own thing, which was great. It was actually an amazing place to work and they gave you so much freedom and responsibility. Um, so I had my little group of freelance writers and nobody knew anything about the internet except for me. I was actually the first, um, I was the first staffer at the Village Voice to have my email address on a business card and they didn't even have villagevoice.com email addresses at the time so I had my interport.net email wow. address on my business card and everyone was very, there was like a, a lot of like bitterness because I was the first, we still used Probably most of you in this room don't know what this is, but we still use this system called Atex, mm. which is like this super old school editing system. Yeah, I'm smiling. Um, uh, and yeah, me too. <laughs> I want to associate myself with that. Atex was a killer. Atex was killer. great. Um, but I was one of the first people to have a PC on my desk with the internet, because I was like, I can't really edit this internet section if I don't have access to the internet. Um, and this was pretty late in the game. This was like 1998 or something. I mean, it was you know fairly far along. Anyway, um, so I did. I loved it for a while, but I just started to get a little bit itchy. Um, and I got it was a um, so it wasn't a cubicle, um, and it was you know it's right there, there, wherever. Um, so it was a really it was great. Like I walked. To oh, work. I mean, really? Oh, yeah, it was literally. Village Voice like, is just like just three like doors two down. Two doors down. Or the the old building is three doors down. Um, and. Uh, Which they shuddered after Hillary left right, because right. Well, they turned it into a high school. It was school all over. You know, yeah. um, but so so that was great. But I did have this like sort of droning air duct thing uh -huh. over my <laughs> desk, and I would come home every day, and like the first thing I would do was take a shower because I just felt like there was all this like grime that was like was like falling on me out of this air shaft. And and that was really one of the things that made me think like I got to be a freelancer. Like I got to work from home. I cannot work under this like droning air duct yeah. thing anymore. I'm I'm casting around here cuz I'm looking for sort of that, you know, the first flame of that burning desire to to right the wrongs of conservation right. and just, to get out there and really tell the world so about showers. climate change and and what I'm hearing is, you know, there was this bad noise in the air shaft. And, you know, it was a good job, but who could put up with that? So, <laughs> no, um, so I, so the other thing was, I loved my job, and I worked with some amazing writers, lots of whom have gone on to, like, do incredible things and write Oscar-winning films and best-selling books and all this stuff. But, um, but I started to feel like I'm editing these people, and it's been such a long time since I've really written anything, and I don't know if, like, what right do I have to be editing these people when I don't actually know if I could do this myself? And I just started getting really itchy to write again. And then subsequent to that, I started getting really, really interested in environmental issues, and I started noticing that. Um, and I had no background whatsoever in science. I had kind of actively shunned it my whole life. Um, and I started noticing did that. Did you take a science course in college? I did not. Did you take a science course in high school? Yes, I did take science uh, in high school, but okay. well, but I didn't. My so at, at my high school, my your senior year, you could opt out of science and take uh -huh. an extra English class. So I have never taken a chemistry class, but I did take this really great class in C.S. Lewis. <laughs> it's a kind of physics, I guess. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, 
So yeah, so I had really actively, I right. did actually, it's not true, I took a class in college, um, it was Jeans for Jocks, and I got a C minus, and like that was sort of, <laughs> that was no, but the it's end interesting. of that. Many, many uh, uh, science writers now, science journalists, you know, they're all, they have PhDs in molecular biology, or they're all but dissertation in chemistry or something like this, but a surprising number of the most successful um, stumble into it as ignorant, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, um, ignorant fools, <laughs> who, of course, are armed with, the, with that great thing that journalism gives you, which is the dumb question. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Although I did have a little bit of a, like, the dumb question, my dumb questions were, were so dumb, and I knew that they were going to be so dumb that I, so I knew that I really wanted to cover this stuff. And I felt like, particularly with climate change at the time, that it was just being covered really badly. This was sort of the, the era of like he said, she said, where they'd like have like a scientist saying climate change was happening, and then they'd have like a politician saying, no, it's not. And the, even the New York Times would say, like every time they would say global warming, they would sort of qualify it, like which, you know, which not everyone believes is happening right. or something. And I just thought there's gotta be, there's a better way to be doing this reporting, but I don't really know what it is because I have no background on this stuff. And I'm gonna ask really, really dumb questions. And so I decided that I wanted to go back to school. So you're coming to this as an activist then? I mean, your interest is? No, I just, it wasn't an activist. I just thought like, there, this is where the story is. That was what I thought. There's the ah. story of the future is gonna be in the environment and these things that are going on now that we're just starting to realize are going to be huge and I want to mm -hmm. write about them mm -hmm. and I don't have any idea how. Because mm -hmm. this is also a period of time, if I, memory serves me correctly, um, with your you know, instincts for rejection, um, <laughs> that the, the sort of the, the legacy um, media are kind of imploding, they're starting to lay off people in great numbers and of course one of the first things that starts to disappear um, are environment writing um, uh, positions because of course uh, as important as the environment um, is, it's often despised by advertisers. Um, so, you know. Yeah, I mean this was, I, that may have been happening already at this time and I just wasn't even aware of it because I was so outside the loop and mm -hmm, clueless mm -hmm. about this whole, that whole well, area. Well, you know, it, uh, you don't, you don't, you didn't miss anything. I mean, uh. <laughs> so yeah, so ultimately I quit my job at the Village Voice, which was um, a lot easier of a thing to do then, I think, than it is now. Like you could quit a job then because it was like, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just get another job. You know, it wasn't, there were actually jobs. Um, so I quit my job and I, uh, I lined up some work, I sort of cobbled together some stuff. Yeah, okay. um, so I got, I had a, I was writing a column um, for New York Magazine, an internet right. column that was sort of like website reviews and trends and stuff. And then I was, um, I um, got a job along with a good friend of mine as we, we co-edited the science and technology coverage for a website called Feed, at uh, FEED, yeah. which no longer the exists. startup, yeah. And um, so that was sort of, that. those two things were enough that at least I could, again, pay the rent. And, mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then I sort of did, you know, I tried to like make my, make my way mm -hmm. as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And I pitched environmental stories and had no success, mm -hmm. but I did other mm -hmm. stories. So I'm, I, before we leave this, I, I wanna, you know, you managed, you took it, um, something I think that happens to people uh, in this business, which is um, you work for a publication that you despise as a way of starting, and in that you acquire accidental expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you seem to have played that accidental expertise into some fairly, um, uh, well, I want to say, you know, good, good, good work. Um, yeah, it's one of those things. Like I always say, like you know, your your mom says, like everything happens for a reason, or like someday you'll, you know, someday you'll see there was like a reason why I'll, you know, you got something out of this, and at the time you're like, oh. <laughs> but it it really ended up being true. Like I feel like this job that I had at Brand Week, which made me come home crying most days, mm -hmm. turned out to be the thing that kind of launched my career in a certain way. So, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. It's, yeah, it's a good thing that you quit, right? It is a good thing that I quit. <laughs> um, 
So, I actually have my eval in this folder also. It turns out to be my, my evaluation from the six months that I was on that job, my like whatever review, which says really? that I'm not a very good team player. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. I won't make you read it then. I won't make you read it. That's the nugget. That's the nugget. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Really needs to work in a more independent setting. Needs Something to be, like that, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> they um, just stamped like freelancer on it and yeah. sent me on my way. Well, I don't want to uh, uh, make you uh, unfurl your entire biography here, but I would like to understand, maybe um, share with us, a little bit more about how this passion for the environment um, got kindled. I mean, what, you, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want you, you have no evidence of this, you know, I mean, you're lucky that you found out something at Brand Week, right? Because yeah. you could parlay that into a nice, uh, good God, section editor's job at the Village Voice, you know? Yeah. Um, where does this come from? I honestly just like don't, because don't like you're really a, you're a dog know. walker in New York and you get worried about the uh, the air your dogs are breathing. I don't understand what. I what, really don't know. I can't. Don't know. I honestly can't tell you. I just know that at some point I was sitting at my desk at the Village Voice reading the course catalog for the Yale School of Forestry, thinking yeah. like I need to do this. And at some point later, after I quit my job, but before I moved to Colorado. I had a job, um, I worked for another internet startup called inside.com, which was this media um, website that like David Carr worked there. A lot of people uh -huh. who went on to be big media reporters worked there and I was helping them start a mag their print magazine, which actually proved to be <laughs> their demise. Um, and uh, it's not, it wasn't my fault, it's not my fault. No, no, we're not gonna blame you. Um, and I just remember it was in the Star at Lehigh building and it was like um, the, I mean, you would get, you'd go there in the morning and there were like 100 people waiting online to get, there were like two elevators for this whole square block building and it was just like, there were so many people working in this office because they kept expanding and expanding and you were like elbow to elbow with people and I just remember coming home one day and saying to my then boyfriend, now husband, I'm working it inside and I should be working it outside. And that was just like, that was just like this really sad thing to me. And I just like, I don't know, it just kept kind of building from there. You uprooted. And eventually, you uprooted we up, physically. You uprooted, uprooted professionally. Yes. You uprooted personally in a uh, funny way. Yes. Uh, Tell us. Um, well, I mean, well, first, somewhere in there, I ended up getting hired as a contributing editor at New York Magazine, covering tech stuff, which turned out to be right before September 11th, um, and then like nobody really wanted to know about tech stuff anymore. The whole, you know, there was a recession, like. Suddenly, the mm -hmm. stuff that they had hired me to write about, nobody really wanted to read about anymore. So I was, um, when my contract was up, they decided not to renew it. And that was, um, that was a huge blow to me. So that was, mm. um, I felt like I'd been fired and it was just like this big failure. And um, when I sort of picked up the pieces, I thought like, oh my God, actually, here's my window of opportunity to leave. And we had been sort of talking about leaving New York for a while, mm -hmm. and what I had really wanted to go out west. My husband is from Albuquerque, and he was really interested in going back west. And so we sort of started looking for a ticket out. And um, I started looking at graduate programs, and sort of ended up. In the environment. And yes, and, and ended so up going you, to the University of Colorado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you worked. Which was sort of an excuse to get out of New York, but it was. Sort of an excuse? I mean, it was. Out. You know, it was sort of an excuse, but it ended up being this terrific thing that I did. So I'm curious, um, you've spent a, a, a significant portion of your career as a journalist in New York, in, you know, what we're constantly being told is, you know, sort of the mecca of big media where, you know, the public perceptions are warped and embroidered and filed down into good shapes and then fed to everybody and <laughs> with their breakfast cereal. Um, <laughs> Uh, there you are out in the West. Um, you are looking at things from the other end of that famous New Yorker Saul Steinberg map of America where New York looms large and the rest of the country is all yeah. pushed into a spoon. Um, how does that affect your, your work? How does that affect how you see things? Does it at all? I mean, are you, um, do we all live in the same kind of virtual world now? Or is it I think it's a lot easier to not be in New York than 
people feel like it's going to be. Um, I mean, I think I was helped by the fact that I started out here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I made all these connections, and then it was a lot easier to not be here. And I could come back to the city for a few days and mm -hmm. call up an editor and say, hey, I'm going to be in town, and let's meet for lunch. And I found, actually, like I ended up sitting down one-on-one -on -one with editors almost more than I had before. But there weren't, what I missed was the sort of like random run-in at a cocktail party or something where it ends up, you know, the editor just, it's like, oh, you know, I have this story to assign. I'm glad I bumped into you. I, you know, just these sort of chance meetings that end up like, then you're right in the person's mind and then they're, then they end up giving you work. And so those things I really didn't have. And I had to like work a lot harder mm -hmm. to. And, and when you work a lot harder, what do you do? Um, well, so I had to come here and actually set up meetings with people. Um, I had to, you know, pitch a lot more, I think. Mm -hmm. I got a, I mean, I dealt with, I had a lot of rejection. <laughs> so I tried to, so I tried to recast myself. So I moved to Colorado and I did this environmental studies program and I tried to like recast myself as a science and environment journalist. Um, and that was a, it was a really uphill battle. How so? Um, I just didn't have the, I didn't have the confidence. I didn't have the connections necessarily. The editors that I knew and worked with like didn't assign those kinds of stories and weren't interested in them. And so it was a lot of, it was almost starting from scratch hmm. to a certain degree. Um, and it was definitely, like there was a lot of rejection. There were a lot of, I mean, I remember like a lot of conversations with my husband in the kitchen where I would say like this is, this is ridiculous. At some point, like you have to realize that you're not going to be you know, you're not going to be a rock star and maybe it's time to like put away your guitar and get a real job. Like I felt very much like that. And I would, you know, I would say, I'm done. I can't deal with this rejection anymore. And then I would sort of sit and think, like, okay, what am I going to do with my life now that I'm not going to be a journalist? And I could never come up with a single other thing that I wanted to do. So I would kind of, like, pick up the pieces and Well, I suppose you again. could have gone back to tech writing. Yeah? <laughs> Just, the internet managed to revive itself. Yeah, uh, you know, I really always, I mean, to me, tech writing is really, bu it's business writing on a certain level. And I've is, always yeah. hated interviewing I've always hated doing business writing because people, the thing that I love so much about writing about science is that like, people want to talk to you about their work, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part. And like people at, you know, business people don't want to talk to you. They have, you know, they're just like towing the corporate line and they have like, they speak in marketing speak and it's just, it's a whole different thing where scientists are like, they're such great story characters. They just like, a lot of them just, you know, couldn't care less of what anybody thinks and they're like, they're journalists dream. You know, like they just kind of like tell, just spew all this great stuff all the time. So let me, if, if uh, and I always want to remind you all that, that if I'm starting to bore you, you need to interrupt. Um, I wonder if we can talk for a minute about how you do make it work. I, I, you, you say pitching a lot and doing, how do you pitch? What is your, what is the process you go through to identify and, and sell a, a story proposal for a big piece? Um, so I am, um, I'm not a person who pitches a lot. Um, I have a friend who likes to, I'm going to be really embarrassed now that this is on video, um, but I have a friend who talks about sperm pitchers and egg pitchers, and he, he talks about, you know, sperm pitchers, like, <laughs> throw a ton, just throw a ton of pitches up at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> And the egg pitchers more sort of like carefully cultivate their, you know, one pitch and make like fewer of them in a year. I didn't come up with this. This is, this a, is, this is a rich metaphor, I can say. <laughs> and, um, so I definitely am more of an egg pitcher. Uh -huh. um, but I, I really don't, like I tend to let stories incubate in my brain for a long time, um, sometimes to the detriment of making money. Um, so, for instance, I did a story that ran in Wired, I think it ran in mm, December, maybe it ran a year ago, December, and it had been a year in the making. Like, it had actually been a year since, I, I think, between the time that I actually saw the guy speak and thought this would be an interesting story and the time that I actually pitched it. And then you it saw was the like guy speak? You're I went to a, a conference. Yeah, okay, no, so. Went to a conference. Do you go to a lot of conferences? Um, not a lot. Do you read journals? But, do you, um, some people find great story ideas on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. So I mean, you know. Yeah, I, um, I, I go to some conferences. Mm -hmm. um, I always get some kind of something from going to a conference, even if it's just like a little thing to file away that becomes a feature story two mm -hmm. years down the line. Um, hmm. So 
I often find I often find stories in on the front page of the New York Times or in other people's stories. I often find stories in my own stories. So mm -hmm. you're on assignment and then you hear about some other thing and end up sort of following that. But in this case, I had gone to a conference and I'd seen this guy give a talk and I was like, wow, there's definitely, there's something in that, but I don't really know what it is yet. And I just like filed it away and sort of thought about it periodically over the next six months. And then maybe after six months, I called him and said, hey, I saw you give this talk six months ago. I'm really interested in doing a story on your work, but I'm not quite sure what it is, and can we just kind of chat about it? So you'll, you'll be open about your uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I tell people, so I tend to do mostly long form stuff, and so I say, I, I say to people, like, this is what I do. I don't do news coverage. I do these kind of longer pieces, and sometimes it's, I'm not quite sure what the story is, but I know there's something in what you said that has the makings of a great feature, and so can we just kind of mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about your work? What's the best, what's your favorite conference? Um, I don't really have a favorite conference. Like, I mean, that was a that ecological conference was, Society of America. Yeah, I mean, a, sometimes those are. I feel like I mean, that I, I've gone to the Ecological Society of America. I've gone to the Society for Conservation Biology. Um, mm -hmm. I think honestly, you can find a story at any of these places if you just. The story is often not. It's not the big talk, and the story often isn't even the talk that someone gives. It's like sort of buried in, or it's like a theme. Suddenly, you hear like there you, there's multiple talks in different sessions on this one theme, and you're like, oh, there's there's something mm -hmm. there. So you you actually go hang in the uh, in the symposia. You don't sort of go to the press conference session. No, I and actually a lot of the conferences I go to don't have press mm -hmm. conferences. That's a good sign. Um, yeah, I think it's a good sign when you're the only journalist there or one of the only journalists there. This story that I was just talking about was like the. Um, it was some like agriculture and genetics conference. I mean, there were really, like these absurd sessions about you know like the genetics of potatoes and how to how to like genetically breed the best kind of potato for potato chips and all this. Like most of the sessions were so far over my head that I just had no idea what they were even talking about. Um. So I'm trying to understand here: uh, independent, strong-minded, forged in the fires of rejection, freelancer that you are. Um, how are you kind of making this kind of uh, fishing cost out? I mean, uh, well, I mean, right now, uh, well, I've done a lot of things. So I've done, um, I've done ghostwriting projects. Ghostwriting um, projects. I've done, uh, I, I've worked on iPad apps. I've oh. done like a, you know, some everything. I think is still journalism or in that realm. Mm -hmm. Like I don't really, I haven't like crossed over into like the advertising. Do you like do thing. annual reports? Uh... No, I've never done anything like that. I mean, I've written um, for some university mm -hmm. magazines, but I've never done annual reports or anything. I mean, I try to, I, I try to do things that at least I find interesting. Right, okay, so um, you have like a portfolio of but I have done different. And... I have done different things. I, I was ghostwriting a book or a book proposal. I've written book proposals for people. Um, I did research for this venture capitalist you write book who wanted proposals to write. For people? I mean, not on a regular basis, but I have wow. written book proposals. For people. Well, I have a book proposal so. you should write for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I so I've done things like that. Um, I mean, I often have. It's it was hard. I mean, that's it, it was definitely hard. My my husband now has actually a. We were both freelancers for the better part of our life mm -hmm. together. He actually now has a job with a paycheck, which has made my life a lot easier. Um, Part of the problem with doing long form stuff is you just the stories like the you get you know you get assigned a story and then maybe you get paid a year later or National right. Geographic it's like two years later yeah, yeah so that's yeah. definitely challenging so I, I'm still and wanting... you can get you can sort of spin your wheels doing stuff like oh god I this is my rent is due and I have to I have to make some money come in and then you end up sort of doing stories that you don't really care about or that you know you maybe so, shouldn't be spending right. your time doing I, I I see the pitfall I see the reef I see the how do you navigate that, though? I mean, so. I mean, you just have to, I think you have to, so it, it used to be a lot easier. Like, you have to kind of have a balance of sort of the longer term, the, the projects that pay a lot, but you're not going to see the check for a year, but they pay a lot, and, and you're sort of putting your heart and soul into it. And then the stuff that's, you know, quick turnaround, you maybe don't care about it as much, but you know the paycheck is coming, even though it's not going to be very much money. At least you know it's coming in a month. And you sort of like have to, you kind of get a sense after a while of what the kind of calculus is of all these things. And then, it, and then of course, it sort of changes because then some of those publications 
fold or your editor leaves mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. suddenly like, mm -hmm. okay, I need to fill in with this other thing. Right. So, but you really kind of had built yourself around those longer uh, field narratives. Yes, although it was really, I mean, it was kind of eye-opening at the at time, like a few years ago, I, I sort of took stock and I realized like I had finally gotten to this point in my career that I had always sort of envisioned, you know, as like the mark of success where I was mostly doing long form stories and I realized like, oh, you can't actually really make a living doing this. You kind of need the shorter stuff in order to mm -hmm. fill in, unless you have like a pot of money already, you know, that you can sort of live off of while you're waiting for the other checks. So it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely challenging. It helps to have a spouse who has a full-time job. I mean, I th honestly, like that's, I think that's how a lot of people make freelancing work, is they have a partner who has a full-time job. So you are someone who likes to travel. You like to travel for stories. Um, how do you pitch a story that involves going halfway around the world? How do you pitch a story that involves a serious commitment to being in the field? I mean, I think you just, I think the magazines that send people places are mm -hmm. not necessarily going to differentiate. Like, if they want to send you somewhere for a story, they don't really care that much if it's, you know, Canada or Ethiopia. Like, mm -hmm. if they have the resources to do travel, mm -hmm. they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the same thing. You just have to convince them that it's a really good story and that you're the person to do it and that you have to go there to do it. So what's your advice to me? Um, about Don't how quit your job. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> no, but as a as a as a field um, journalist, like um, you know, people have their their field tricks. They have their their techniques. There are certain pitfalls to reporting, like as an as an embedded journalist. I mean, with the research group, um, if, if you don't mind, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, so. You know, I, I've mentioned this to you uh, a couple of weeks ago. Latham's Quarterly did this very funny thing. They have a, a standing graphic feature um, that they do about various things. And, and quite recently, in the most recent one, they they went and they they did a, 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 a kind of a snapshot of what different reporters uh, or writers through history had actually carried in their travel bag. Um, and they started they took this very seriously, being Latham's, of course. So they started with the Odyssey. But I'm not going to bore you with what he put in the cargo hold of his ship. But Leonardo da Vinci, you'll be amused to know, traveled with a chest full of uh, pink and purple robes. You know, uh, Nellie Bly, one of the great uh, pioneering uh, uh, women journalists, uh, when she was working for the New York World, she was assigned to go around the world, and she packed in her small bag, among other things, two caps three veils, a pair of slippers, a flask, a jar of cold cream, and she said a liberal supply of handkerchiefs. Um, Joan Didion, uh, in her reporting years, uh, reports that she always packed two skirts, two jerseys, one pullover, a bottle of bourbon, a carton of cigarettes, a mohair throw, and a typewriter. So what I asked... Oh, that must have been so heavy. <laughs> and she's so small, I mean... <laughs> um, but I'm curious if you'd share with us what's in your bag. Um, it's not really not really, really fair. Long wind up and no. Uh, no, no, no. I am. Um, I. I mean, the things I'll tell you the things that I always have with me. Yeah, right, so I right, always right. have my iPhone. Always have your iPhone. I always have Starbucks Vias. This is like I never go anywhere for a reporting trip without Starbucks Vias. I'm not being paid by Starbucks to say this, but um, because you never know when you are going to be in the middle of nowhere having to get up and do an interview, and you're exhausted and groggy, and you're in some like crappy ass motel, and the only coffee is like from some gas station, like watery gas station coffee. And so if you have your Starbucks beer with you, all you need is some hot water. Um, this is the, this is so you don't do cold brew? You're not one of those people? You know, with the cold brews that they sell in most 7-Elevens, mm -hmm. like, they're just milk with like a little bit of coffee in them. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Okay. I, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So, right, yeah, so, Starbucks. So there you are are with your, your iPhone. You like have like you know, 12 different kinds of chargers and three storage batteries, lest you lose your iPhone. Uh, no, I'm very right. minimalist. minimalist. I have a, like a, a notebook, like a little right in the rain field reporting notebook and a couple pens and my iPhone and um, some sneakers, some 
field pants. So, Hillary, I have a question about that. Uh, hello. <laughs> so I have one gray I, I was pair. Waiting for her. <laughs> I have one pair that are sort of camouflage. No, not specifically. Not specifically about your clothes. <laughs> More broadly than that. So I find that when I'm traveling, yeah. I, I often am sort of caught by all the preparation that I've that I've done because I, I worry all the time. I have to plan everything. I have to make sure I get my lead. I have to make sure I get, you know, my data. I, I mm. need to get my scene, you know, whatever. And it and and so I, I, I find that when I'm on the on the road, it's like just a constant contest between wanting to make sure that I'm prepared, but also leaving room for spontaneity. And usually being prepared wins. And so I often find myself just coming back with exactly what I thought that I was going hmm. to get because I'm so paranoid about not wasting the trip or wasting all the money that you know goes into the trip. So to what extent do you do that kind of prep? And are you like me? Do you find that it winds up constraining you on the road because you're so scheduled? That's a great question. How do you build in the preparation without losing the opportunity for accidents? Yeah, I mean, I think I, it's, I'm definitely not as well prepared as it sounds like you are. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a chronically disorganized person and maybe that might work in my favor. My sister's nodding her head over here. Um, that might work. I, I try to do like the sort of minimal amount of preparedness that will make the trip not a waste of time. Like I wanna know that the person knows that I'm coming and that we have something set up and we're gonna spend the day together and you know we're gonna meet at this place. But beyond that, like I don't want to do much more than that. I want to know like who I need to meet with and make sure that I'm going to get them. But I want to have like as little else sort of planned and set up as possible. Is that just accidental or is that intentional? Um, it probably started out as accidental and it worked, and so now it's somewhat intentional. Um, I had I I was supposed to go to Canada last week on assignment and I got sick and ended up not going, and I was a little bit panicked because I had not, I was relying on someone else to set some stuff up for me. And he told me he had set up these meetings, but they ended like they were with people that I hadn't actually directly communicated with. And that made me a little bit nervous. And I thought like this has the potential to be like a bad thing if I get there and he's messed up the dates or times or he hasn't understood what I wanted. Mm -hmm. or So that was probably erring too far on that side. I don't know, because I ended up not being able to do the trip. So just to do this for a minute, so um, some reporters I know in, in that situation will have, uh, and Dan, maybe you're one of them, um, you know, I'm going to meet with uh, Professor so-and-so with their lab. You go and you download every paper they've uh, published since 1950. You read all of those. You go talk to three people about Professor so-and-so. Uh, you call Professor so-and-so in advance and you actually interview them for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go visit them. Yes, I do You do, do that. that. I mean, I don't download every paper they have. Well, no, but you I, know I, mean. I do. I do. Well, I'll download a lot of the material beforehand and read it. Yeah. Or have them send me stuff that's relevant. Ah, okay. And then I do do. So I just, I just did the story where I went to Nevada. It was a paleontology story. And I um, went to Nevada and camped out in the desert with a a group of people and I did I, I read a bunch of stuff beforehand they actually were nice enough to like they shared their whole Dropbox folder with me of all the research and that they had uh, all their data okay. for this thing right. so I read a lot of that stuff ah, right. I did about an hour long interview ah, with the scientist okay. and then and then I ah, all right. and then I just showed up and I didn't know what was I just said like how many days do you think I need to be there and then we'll just kind of see what happens like I didn't really but know this who is the not other exactly people were as, no as I mean I'm art, not like as artless as it I'm not appears. showing up like an idiot, but I'm. Well, but I, I just know. think if you if you sort of have too strong of an agenda and you're too wedded to your agenda, mm -hmm. you end up. You don't leave yourself open to sort of serendipity or something. Yeah. Yes. Um. So Great. you called yourself a disorganized person, but earlier you discussed juggling between sort of the long term big stories with the very quick just have to turn around smaller so stories. So I'm wondering how, as a supposedly disorganized person, you, um, you kind of handle that so that nothing gets lost in the woodwork and mm. 
you don't lose track of anything. God, you guys make good reporters here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, so some people might have like a spreadsheet where they have like all the different places that they write for and how quickly they pay or how much they might actually make those decisions in an organized, orderly fashion. They have, I mean, I know freelancers who have business plans and spreadsheets and all these kinds of things. And I have like a, some kind of sense. <laughs> what, like I, I just sort of have a sense of like what kinds of things I need. So it's sort of disorganized. Yeah. I mean, I like really, I'm terrible. I don't I'm even know her. how to make a spreadsheet. I'm with her. I don't believe you. It, you, can, you, you she's believe she's you. skeptical. Do you, do you wanna, and she's right to be do you skeptical. Wanna, do you want to weigh in here? <laughs> Um, no, I mean. No, I really know. don't. I'm very. I'm. I'm really like. I don't know how to drives my husband crazy because I, mean, I don't know how to make. I don't know how to make a spreadsheet. My, I give stuff to my accountant. <laughs> you have an accountant. Okay. I have an accountant. Yeah. I mean, right. I. I'm very. I just like. I keep like all my things that people do in spreadsheets. Like I do in a Word document. And okay. I, um, uh, I'm on a list with a bunch of um, science writers who are all incredibly organized, and they're always talking about like what tools they use and Scrivener, Scrivener and DevonThink and. Eon timeline and like all the and I'm I am incredibly insanely jealous, right. but I don't have the time to like sit down and learn how to use these things. And I have a really super disorganized system that works for me. Like it's like when you have piles on your desk and you know where you know what the piles are, but no one else could kind of come in and make sense of it. Well, the so, piles aren't for other people. That's right. right. The piles are not for other people. So. So how do you, I want to stay with her question though, so how do you work, how do you, and we'll go back to Borneo, um, how do you set up in the morning? Where do you write? What do you write with? And how do you keep track of where you are? Um, so I have, so, um, well I, ha I used to have an office in my house, right. um, which I loved, but it did not have a door, it had like a sort of cutout, and then I had a child, and that just turned out to not be a very efficient mm -hmm. thing. Um, so we ended up turning the um, turning that room into his playroom. Mm -hmm. It was a really nice playroom. It was a really nice office. Um, <laughs> so now I, my husband has this has his office out back in a separate building. This beautiful it is straw bale. Um, he built it himself. It's this beautiful like passive solar, super mm -hmm. green building. Um, which was his office and his like bike building, motorcycle building man place. And <laughs> now the poor guy has had to have me move in there with him. So we share an office. We try oh, to put our desks office, okay. as far away from each other as possible. But it's it's it is actually challenging because he is. We just we don't do the same thing, and he's on the phone a lot of the day, and like it doesn't really work. Uh -huh. But anyway, that's what where I work. So I go out there in the morning, um, and I just have my laptop. I have a whiteboard. Um, Whiteboard, which okay. I on which I write like what stories I'm working on mm -hmm. and when they're mm -hmm. due and how much mm -hmm. money is coming in from them and that's oh. you know you don't you're not a second class citizen just because you don't do it electronically. I guess it is a spreadsheet. I guess it's a spreadsheet. That sorts, in fact yeah. I think that's where they got the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. So I have a slightly different type of question. I'm a scientist interested in journalism as opposed to a journalist interested in science. So I'm curious as to, in your travels, who was the most interesting scientist you interviewed and what about them made them interesting to you as a journalist? Wow. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I, don't, I can't. I honestly don't know that I can think of one person offhand who was the most interesting. But I can tell you what makes scientists most interesting, and that is um, actually, you know what? One of the one of the most interesting scientists I have interviewed is a woman named Diana Six, who's an ecologist at the University of Montana. And what makes her so interesting is that she's a person. She's a human being, and she's like, and she will talk to you about the things that she does that are not science. She's a bodybuilder. She brews her own beer. She's an entomologist, and she, for a while, was making beer using the yeast of different insects. She had this group, her little homebrew company mm -hmm. called Six-Legged Ales. Um, and she's not, she's, actually, interestingly enough, she's really interested in journalism, and she's now doing, she's a full professor, and she's enrolled in the master's program in right. journalism at the exactly. University of Montana, which is yeah. super cool also. And also, she works on a really interesting problem. 
that, that yes. Go ahead, tell, tell them. No, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's working on uh, an invasive beetle that is basically destroying large sections of the northern forest, and no one is sure exactly why, uh, but it's happening incredibly quickly. Uh, and the, the, six, the ecological succession is really interesting. She studied, and she also she studies the fungus that this beetle carries and sort of how the beetle and the fungus This is the pine bark beetle? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. not the pine beetle. Um, yeah. but did she make beer out of the pine beetle? She did. For, she, actually wow. brewed, she actually brewed it with yeast that the pine beetle carries yeah. for a little while. That's really so. coming to terms with an environmental Yeah, disaster. I mean, so she's just like, she's, very, she's, she's like incredibly smart. She's incredibly, uh -huh. um, you know, good at communicating, but she's also not afraid to show you that she's a real person. And this is very unusual, though. I don't but, actually, but not, not I don't for know if it's that. This is, this is unusual for human beings. I don't know. <laughs> you know, many of us are not interesting. I, rem I, I gave a talk um, uh, to some STEM, women in STEM scientists, and um, one of them was talking about using Twitter, and she was saying how she, so she was a, um, some, she did some kind of like endurance racing or something. She was a psychologist, and she was talking about how she had like two Twitter personas, and one was her science persona, and one was her like endurance, whatever this racing thing that she did was. And she didn't, she was like always worried about people sort of hearing the wrong, you know, people from one world kind of hearing mm. about her other world. And I was like, are you kidding me? If I was looking for a psychologist in your area and I knew that there was a psychologist in your area who also did this like endurance sport, like you're the person I would come to because that just makes you a kind of more fascinating right. It gives you the person. stamina to put up with <laughs> also, my right, emotional too, problem. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. Um, so I want to get... Uh, stay on a practical note here for a second, though, if, 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 if you're satisfied. Okay. Um, which is, uh, with your whiteboard uh, spreadsheets and your, your uh, 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 cultivated air of uh, cluelessness, um, you, in fact, are very precise and very, how shall I say, persnickety um, when it comes to contracts when it comes to clauses, uh, when it comes to rights and permissions. And just for, for, to illustrate that, um, I uh, know that for a couple of years you've blogged at uh, PLOS I as uh, right. Tooth and Claw, yes. as one of your smaller things while you're pursuing the big thing, but a very nice, uh, steady thing. And in 2012, um, they changed their licensing rules and you quite publicly resigned your blog, which is not something a normal person who was not attuned to this sort of thing would do. Well, they weren't I, paying me, so that was <laughs> made no, it but, easier to resign. <laughs> you know, sometimes the, the people who are doing it for free are, will put up with the most abuse. Um, I wonder if you give us a sense of your, how you see freelancers and their ability to stand up for themselves. Yeah, so I mean, I think there are, I think there are some things that you can change and there are some things that you can't change. In a contract or in the world or with? <laughs> I guess in the world, but in a contract or in a relationship with a publisher. Mm -hmm. And so I just had an interchange with someone the other day. Um, I, there, I got a contract that I did not like for a very small article that I didn't really want to do anyway. But I got this contract and I asked them to change it. It had an indemnity clause, which was very restrictive. Um, and indemnity clauses are where um, you, basically they say, like, in case that anyone sues, we, you know, we, we're not liable and you're liable. So you, you bear all the costs and we, the, you know, deep-pocketed publication, bear none of the costs. It very rarely happens that a journalist ends up sort of on the line for huge legal bills, but nonetheless, the risk is there. And this story was like a, it was like several hundred dollars. It wasn't something I was going to, like, risk my house for. And I said, I sorry, you know, I, I actually don't sign indemnity clauses like this. Could we remove this clause from the contract? I said this to the editorial assistant or whoever had sent me the contract. And she went and checked with the editor in chief, who obviously wrote her back an email that was probably not meant for my eyes, um, but she quoted it to me in an email in her response. She said, "This is what so and so has said," and it was really offensive. And it said, I'm not going to name the publication or anything, but, I, but it said, um, it said, that's absurd. P 
indemnity clauses are standard across all media, which is totally not true. Like most of the publications I write for do not have indemnity clauses. So that was just not true. And then it said, and after consulting with our lawyer, you know, in future, our future contracts, the indemnity clause is going to be even scarier. That was literally, that was the word that he used, scarier. And I just thought like how this guy is the, the editor of a publication, like he should be sort of on the side of the writers. Like, we're all sort of in this together, and I don't want to work for an editor who is like already antagonizing me and doesn't even, we haven't even gotten started on the assignment. And this, that was the editor in chief. He wasn't the one who would have been directly editing it, but I just said, sorry, you can assign it to someone else. Because I'm not gonna, I just think that's, I just think that's, that's offensive and that's a, like a really bad starting point for a relationship. And to have someone, you know, I think like the best relationships that you have with editors are the ones where there's give and take and you sort of, you know, everybody kind of, you, you really like, you know, stand your ground when it's something that you really care about, but you also sort of like cede to them when it's something that you know, you know, is more important to them. And it's this kind of give and take relationship. And I don't want to work for someone who is just going to be a dick from the get-go. <laughs> so, so I, you know, that, that's sort of my, that's the thing. I just think there's no reason for. I think many freelancers yeah. think they just don't have any standing. Well, I, th I mean, I think a lot of freelancers, I think, don't actually. So, I mean, I spent years not actually ever reading a contract. Like, you're so excited. You're like, oh, my God, this magazine wants me to write a story for them, and they're going to pay me for it? Like, cool, you know, sign on the dotted line. And then you, like, once I sort of started reading contracts, I was like, wait <laughs> Wait a minute, you know? And as a freelancer, like really you, you know, your copyright is something very important that you have and, and you know, your ability to get paid and they're just things that you want to sort of stick up for. And obviously it's a lot harder when you're starting out to, you know, it's a lot harder to negotiate a contract because they can just say, sorry, we're going to assign that to somebody else. So, you know, you have to kind of like take it a little, suck it up a little bit when you're starting out, but I think, I, I feel like it's my responsibility also as someone who's like, in, I'm in a position where I can turn down assignments, and I feel like it's my responsibility to do that, to sort of like, you know, stand up for the people. We have someone standing <laughs> up for a question. You're way in the back there. Hello, sorry, I'm hidden back here. Um, I'm a freelancer too, and I had a question more about your work um, on a story. Have there been any quotes or stories that were particularly hard to get that ended up being really rewarding to work on or, you know, fun at the end of it all after all the struggle? <laughs> um, gosh, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I think sometimes the hardest thing is like finding the story, like sometimes, that's sometimes my biggest struggle. Like I know I have this idea and I know I have a topic and I know that there's a really good story in it, but you just like, you end up calling this person and that person and this person and that person and no one, everyone's just sort of like, you're, you're like dancing around the, the story and you just like at some point you're like, oh, I should just toss this aside, but you sort of keep going and then ultimately like landing on the actual story in that is super satisfying. I remember hearing a talk once by John Lee Anderson, um, the New Yorker writer, who was talking about his book on Che Guevara, and he was talking about how he had, um, he had, he was trying to get some particular piece of information, and he had done like interview after interview after interview, and was just about to give up on like ever basically getting this piece of information. And he was exhausted from reporting, and he had one more meeting that he was supposed to go to, and he was just like, I can't leave my hotel room, I need to cancel this. Like, he was just done. But he pushed himself to go, and that turned out to be the interview that, like, opened up all the doors, and, you know, the, he finally got the information he needed, and more. And the, you know, the takeaway is, like, you sort of always, you should always just do that extra interview, because you never know, like, it's going to be the thing that you... You know that you were that that piece of information or that thing that like makes the story that you always you know you didn't think you were gonna get. Yeah. Hi, Hillary. Um, I was wondering on a more practical, broader level, you mentioned um, that when you entered freelance, it was not as glamorous as you had expected it to be. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it was different from your expectations. Um. Um, well, so, I mean, I think one thing was the t times really were different and are different. And so, um, like, I had, 
I knew people who were older than me who had become freelancers like a decade earlier and really did, it really was glamorous. Like they had these magazine contracts where they, you know, fly business class and they like, you know, they just had, you know, like you hear people talk about this stuff, right? Like just the kind of expense accounts and I don't know, just the whole like, you know, getting, just having like, you know, assignments after assignment after assignment that you just kind of like land in your lap and you're just like, you know, next thing you know, there you are sitting with Graydon Carter, like drinking your martini and talking about where, you know, what, what great far flung place they're going to send you to next. And I think like for a certain group of writers older than me, like it, there was a lot of that. Um, but I think by the time I sort of started doing it, I also think I don't, you know, a lot of the, I think a lot of my image of what it was came from like the people who do sort of celebrity journalism. Um, and I obviously don't do that. And so like going to, you know, reporting in a Nairobi slum is not really this, as exciting as like interviewing Madonna or whatever. So I think I just thought, I think I just, I think I just envisioned that there would be more like, I don't know, like sitting with your editor for, you know, weeks, like sort of pouring over this story, like in the offices of the New Yorker. Or, and I get, maybe it's just that I don't, I haven't achieved that level or I don't write for the New Yorker, but I think I just thought it would, I didn't realize how much there was of the sort of grunt work, like how much there was of like waiting for the paycheck or trying to get paid when your, you know, your mortgage is due. And But it seems like you do travel a lot, uh, so do you actively search for stories that involve travel or how do you, how do you build that into your timeline? You know, I have to say, actually, this doesn't really fit the like globe globetrotting environmental reporter right. thing. But a, I right. have to say, right now, I am actually actively looking to not travel <laughs> because I have a two-year-old, and so I just had a meeting with an editor today where I he wanted me to do a story that involved going to the Amazon, and I actually was like, please, can I just do a story in Colorado? <laughs> um, but that's because I am in a particular time where I have this small child, and I, um, you know, it's. It's harder to travel. Um, yeah, for I mean, for a while I would. I would. I mean, there are times when I've sort like I wanted to go to Borneo. I've always wanted to go to Borneo. I wanted to like see orangutans in the wild, and so I did sort of search for a way to do that particular thing. Um, I did look for far flung stories that would take me to places that I wouldn't have a chance to go otherwise. But right now I, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> so how do you do the juggle? The kid thing. Mm -hmm. Um. It's just, it's it's really hard. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's hard. Like when I'm when I'm home, I'm sort of dreaming about being out in the field somewhere. And when I'm out in the field, I'm like desperate to get home. It's I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> I mean, do you thought of taking him with you? Or I have taken him with me. Actually, yeah. when he was six weeks old, I took him. Actually, I, I that scientist that I was talking about before, Diana Six, um, mm -hmm. I took him on a reporting trip to Montana when he was six weeks old. Um, I took him to Costa Rica this summer. So I, yeah, I'd like to. I mean, I like the idea of that. Mm -hmm. But there's yeah, certain yeah. places. I mean, he's two. I'm not going to probably take him to Borneo or something. I don't know. Sometimes there, are, it's most. It's easiest to travel with them when they're really young. Yes, like this kind, yeah, of, kind size. of size. Inert, yeah, not so much like own. this yeah, size. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've done a lot of travel reporting, but how did you get editors to take you seriously at first in order to get the approval to go on those stories or those trips to report? Well, I guess I did. I mean, I think I, I, think I started small. So I started, you know, I started with stories that were here that I didn't have to do any reporting for. And when I worked for New York Magazine, I did, you know, I didn't travel. I did all my stories here. And so I think I built up a track record with that. And then, um, and then I did, I mean, the first publications that sent me places, I think actually the first place that might have sent me somewhere international was a magazine called Seed, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a pretty small magazine and so it was you know a smaller magazine was willing more willing to take a risk and I did um, you know and I did like domestic travel so like high country news which is this publication out west would you know they sent me to where like Arizona or something which is obviously doesn't cost that much and, and then you sort of then you have kind of like you know here I can do this story I'm, I can report from field here's the evidence and then you kind of go to the next magazine and say like send me to Kenya or whatever 
Um, I've also done stuff where I've had, you know, paid for the reporting other ways. So like, you know, I had this Alicia Patterson fellowship, and so that, you know, I like you can get grants and stuff like that to to report. So I did a story. Um, I, I went to Borneo and I actually had a photographer that I was going with had raised money to do this trip. And so I was able to go to a couple different places, Newsweek and Mother Jones, and say like, hey, I'm, I'm going to Borneo. You don't have to pay for it. I want to do the story for you from there. And they were excited about that. Um, so many of us here are just starting out. So what would be your advice for people just starting out? Um, to, just do, in general. <laughs> uh, Due to the nature of where you're talking about how the nature of freelancing has changed. Yeah, so I mean, to, I really do think for starting out, and I, and I did this, and I'm glad that I did it, I think your best, like the smartest way to be a freelancer is to have a job first. Because um, I, I mean, I, that made it a lot easier for me. Um, I think I wouldn't, it would have taken me a lot Long, it took me a long time anyway, but it would have taken me a lot longer had I not already made connections with editors while I was while I had a staff job. Um, it's hard to start out as an outsider unless you're just like a super amazing networker. Um, and so I think like I would suggest having a job first and making connections, even if it's something that you only do for a year. Um, I also think going and living someplace, like if you're really committed to being a freelancer, going and living someplace where the stories that you want to write about are happening is, you know, is really a, like a, a great idea when you're young and you are, you know, there's just you and you can just kind of go and live cheap and live out of a place and then you're there and then, you know, you, nobody has to pay for the travel because you're already there. So I'm, I'm curious, we're, we're on the eve of a major climate conference in Paris. Um, it's a topic that in a variety of ways you pursued for quite a long time. Seems very much in your heart. Um, I wonder how you feel your colleagues, other science journalists, the media, whatever you want to call the big us, um, are doing these days with trying to cover climate change. I mean, it's clearly gone in phases over the yeah. decades. Um, you know, I hate the like talking about like the media because mm. I just feel like there's so many different mm -hmm. ways that people cover stuff, and some of it is great and some of it is terrible. But I also think, by and large, I think for the past decade, like if you want to talk about the media, like they've actually done a pretty good job of covering climate change. Like I think it's a really, really hard thing to cover. And it's starting to get easier because now it's actually starting to really happen in places where you can see it and write about real people experiencing real things. But I don't really think that the, I don't think that the media has been the problem. Like I think people like mm. to blame the media for stuff, but I actually think the media has done a pretty good job of covering climate change of late, you know, in the last decade, say, and that the problem is politics, mm. not the mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. So how do you peel off, uh, how do you turn something as large and as intractable as a planetary change and make it into a story that seems to be something you have specialized in. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard. Like, I find actually the most difficult thing about the stuff that I do is that I don't, like, I don't even want to write about these things because they're so depressing. You know, this has been a problem where I find, like, I don't want to read stories about the stuff that I write about because it's depressing. And so I've sort of searched for ways to tell stories in, about depressing things, but in ways that are not depressing, in ways that have an engaging character or are about sort of something else, where the focus is on something else so that it's not just relentlessly depressing. So like I got, I've gotten a lot of traction out of writing about genetics and conservation, because mm -hmm. that's turned out to be something, like I had such a hard time selling conservation stories for years. And then all of a sudden I sort of found this way to talk about it which was in the context of this like kind of cool science of genetics and look how we're using this cool science to try and solve this kind of intractable problem. And so I think, you know, I think it's just about looking for interesting stories and looking about stories looking for stories that aren't relentlessly depressing because there's a lot of bad news. I mean, we need to talk about this stuff and we need to write about this stuff, but trying to find the really interesting stories that people aren't going to read and want to cry. <laughs> Well, 
Yeah, I, I want to read to you something that you wrote um, God. a little while ago, kind of on this topic. It was actually after you'd come back from a, uh, a meeting of the environmental, uh, the, excuse me, uh, ecological yeah. society, uh, where I guess there was an awful lot of um, yeah. grim news, and you wrote, um, quote, but the gloom overload raises a pesky question for me as a journalist. If I can't bear to hear the news, how can I communicate it to the public? What sort of articles or books should I be writing? Where is the balance between grim facts and hopeful innovations? How can I continue to write about what I believe is the most important topic of our time while maintaining my sanity? So. I wonder if you could tell us how you answered that question for yourself. Um, I mean, I don't know that I have necessarily answered it. I, I just think I tried to find stories. Like, so I'm, I'm grappling with this thing right now where I have to go write on a topic that I find very important, but that depresses me to no end. And I'm, um, I am really struggling with it. Like, I'm sort of simultaneously really excited to go do the reporting and sort of dreading it. Um, and I think, I mean, mentally you have just have to sort of like steel yourself, which is I think the same is true if you're writing about, you know, terrorism or whatever. There's just like a lot of bad stuff in the world. And so you have to sort of just emotionally kind of prepare yourself for it. But I also think, it, again, like if you can sort of try to find another way into the story. Um, so like can you tell the story about the, can you tell the story about this declining species by talking about somebody who's, desperately trying to save it, or you know, is there, what is the sort of human drama that isn't, that, that is sort of compelling and we can get caught up in so that we're kind of distracted a little bit from the you know, last of the species kind of thing. So like, uh, you know, there's three rhinos left, but like, can we tell a story about this guy who's been, spent his whole career trying to save the rhinos and live among the rhinos, and I mean, I'm making this up, but like, um. Hi, Hillary. I actually was going to ask a question that was just like what you asked, so I don't know if this will overlap. Um, I was going to ask, what to you makes a great climate story? Because it's not always true that a very large, compelling problem will be the best story. But since we kind of have already been touching on this, a follow-on question would be, what is your like, is there a story that you've read recently that you thought was excellent in climate reporting or environmental reporting? Yeah, so, well, this is gonna be boring because we've talked about this before, but um, I, I thought the story in Esquire about climate scientists being depressed was hmm. just brilliant. It was one of those stories where I was like, oh, why didn't I write that story? It's just, so this is a story, it was a story that ran in Esquire about um, sort of the psychology of being a climate scientist right now and how do you like get up every morning and deal with this information that you possess about you know how the world is falling apart and and trying to communicate that to people and how do you like how do you get out of bed in the morning um, and I just thought that was like such a great human story I mean it's a great question like how and I, and I deal with this all the time you know I have I constantly writing stories about people who are you know they've been studying X, endangered species for their whole career and now like there are you know half as many of them as there used to be and it's like every you know every year it gets worse and worse and worse and yet they still continue to do their research and um, I just think to, to sort of look at the psychology of that is just such a great original take on mm -hmm. it. It is but also it this poses a curious challenge for journalists or for environmental writers I mean we do on some level traffic in novelty, in newness. Um, so it's a story when there are only six rhinos. Is it a story when there are only five? Is it still a story when there are only four? Um, it's a story when the sea ice, summer sea, a uh, winter sea ice cover, uh, or summer sea ice cover in the Arctic reaches um, a record low. Is it a story when it reaches another record low and another record low? Right. I mean, I guess it's a news story all those times. So, I mean, I don't, because I don't write news, mm -hmm. I don't tend to think in that way. Like, I'm thinking, well, what's, 
what's the story about the sea ice melting? What is the story that I can actually tell about that? Like, is there somebody that's being impacted or is there someone mm -hmm. that's studying this or what's the, you know, I'm trying to tell the sort of larger story behind that. But I think it is a news story at all those points. I mean, mm -hmm. it might as well be. Um, as someone who focuses on long form journalism, could you talk a little bit about how you think about the structure of your story at each stage in the process? Yeah, um, so I, um, I write like very, very vague outlines. Like, you know, I just sort of maybe write, try to like write down six, five or six sections, like what I, and then I, what I usually do is I write down the scenes that I have and try to kind of build around them, like write down all of the scenes that I could potentially use from the reporting I've done and then try to pick out the ones that actually might move the story along. And then I sort of, um, you know, you have to kind of try and interweave the, the action reporting with the background um, and uh, come to some kind of resolution. I mean, I have a problem because a lot of the stuff that I write about doesn't have a resolution. And so I always get, I always like sort of write through and I get, I have like these five sections that I've wanted to put together and I get to the end and then I'm like, what's, what's the end? <laughs> I have a huge problem with endings because like there's never really an ending. Um, and that's the thing that I always get stuck on. But yeah, I try to, um, Austin, what's the action background? I just want you to tell me what it is. A and B. So there's a very basic magazine structure, ac action, background. Development. <laughs> I clearly know this really well. <laughs> action, background, yeah, development, and then another development, yeah. and then climax. I mean, choice is the way I put it. Oh, okay. I thought it was climax. So and then. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I can see you learned from it. <laughs> um, and then ending. Yeah. <laughs> That's the last one. Yeah. So there is a kind of basic, you right. know, formula of magazine writing that I try to like at least have something, you know, approximating that. And then you kind of get storyboard creative. Stuff? And, I don't storyboard. You stuff. don't hang index cards. No, up? but I really am fascinated by the idea. And actually, there's a great in one of the long form podcasts. Brendan Kerner talks about how he has actually started using, does anybody, does anybody listen to this? It's really a great interview. You guys should listen to this one. It's Brendan Kerner on the Long Form Podcast. And he talks about how he actually, like, he takes pictures of everything. Mm -hmm. Like, every scene in his story has some kind of visual thing. So even maybe it's a document that he takes a picture of or whatever. And he actually, like, spreads it all out on the floor and kind of looks at it that way, which I think is, I mean, I think he's talking about this for books more than magazine articles, but that seems to me to be a great way to sort of like visually think your way through a story. I, I just want to say too that before anybody gets too obsessed with oh, there he is. With, uh, <laughs> with that kind of set structure is, is that every, <laughs> there's a reason that we don't teach you that. <laughs> that, that, you know, that, that kind of straight yeah. formulaic <laughs> structure. It, it, it's kind of a it's it's an okay way to it, it's it's important to to think about features having c components and they need those components but it's really hard to make it fit a particular matrix. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely. I, I, I just find it useful for thinking uh, just for thinking about like okay, well, I need to like s put people in the scene and then I need to take a step back and explain like where we are and why we're here and then stuff needs to happen. Um, I always think like the most important thing in the story is motion. So um, my mom used to have this expression where she would say, tell your story walking, and what it meant, like if you were just saying something mm. like, you know, annoying or whatever, that was her thing. Tell your story walking, but I actually like really took that to heart as a writer, and I think tell your story walking is like the best advice that you can give to a journalist. Like you always want to be walking your way through a story. There always needs to be some kind of forward motion. Yeah, that is really important, the yeah. sense of momentum in a story. And, never looking back, always moving steadily yeah. forward. It's absolutely essential. I have a question about the, uh, this idea of uplifting versus depressing. You know, in, in content, it's funny, I, I have never found that to be a problem. I've been writing about depressing things my whole life, but, but I, I just, I, 
I just think things are either interesting or not, and, and it doesn't seem important to me whether, they, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic. I just care whether they're interesting. So it's, it's, it's interesting to me to meet an accomplished writer who doesn't see it that way. So I guess I wanted to learn more about that. I don't think that, I don't think, I mean obviously we need to write about things that are depressing and a lot of the most important stuff in the world is depressing. But I just think, I just know, I know that I feel you know, overwhelmed and I like sometimes can't read. Like I'll see a story that I'm really interested in reading but like I just can't bring myself to read it because I know how depressing it's gonna be. And so I feel like if I'm feeling that way and this is the stuff that I care about and cover, there are a lot of other people who are feeling that way and how can I kind of get, how can I get them to read about these things that I think are really important? Or like how can I, how can I get a magazine like Wired to, to write about this and bring this stuff to their audience? How can I get Wired to do a story about the environment? Um, and, and there has to be a way to do that and one way is like, oh, well it's also about genetics or oh, it's also about this kind of big idea that, you know, or this whatever counterintuitive thinking like how can I how can I frame the story that's really about something depressing in a way that just like sort of brings it to readers who might otherwise not and what yeah one way is to just tell like a really really great story but you also have to sell it to an editor first and I find that a lot of editors are less likely to want to run really depressing stories about the environment I think we have a question right here. So just backing, backing up a little bit, how do you find that balance between engaging human storytelling and conveying the reporting? Um, I think you, I mean, I think you do it in a way by sort of juggling back and forth between the kind of broader context of the piece and the human element. Like you've got to have some kind of character. And maybe your character, I mean, with environmental stories, it can sometimes be hard because like maybe your character is a fish or maybe, you know, like your character is, is sometimes not a person. And that is a huge challenge. Um, I, I mean, sometimes I try to like figure out like how can I write about this sort of seemingly really boring thing in a, in a like it, it really is a challenge. Like how can I sort of talk to people about this idea in a way that they're gonna, like their eyes aren't gonna glaze over. Um, and actually so something that I do whenever I come back from a reporting trip and I'm trying to like think through how can I tell this story, I will sit down, I will either like sit down with my husband or tell a friend and I will just like go out for a beer or something and talk about hey, I just came back from this reporting trip and this happened and that happened and I like really, I will gauge like when are they actually hmm. listening to what I'm saying and when can I tell that their mind has wandered and they're thinking about something else. And that is, hmm. I think that's actually a really good way to sort of gauge like, or, or I, thought, I thought this thing was really interesting but they're clearly not responding to it. Maybe am I just not telling it the right way or is it just not an interesting detail or an interesting thing? Hmm. Yeah, and it can often work the other way too. The part that you think you went in there yeah. thinking is like the official story that you went there to get and you're kind of playing it to them and their eyes are glazing over and then, you know, after the second period you tell them some other story <laughs> that actually, <laughs> yeah, and they that, perk up and it yeah. actually is a way of test marketing. Yeah, I it's, don't mean that cynically. But, no, but uh, it's true. And sometimes, I mean, having a really good editor can actually be a huge help. Like I'm, yeah. I have a, a feature that I'm working on now where there was like a thread of the story that I just completely dropped because I got kind of, yeah. I couldn't figure out how to weave it in and I got kind of bored by it and I thought like, oh, no one's gonna care. And the editor was like, wait a minute, where did this thing go? Like, this is so fascinating. And I was, when she got more interested in it, I got interested in it again and then I started to like dig back through my reporting and realize that I had all this amazing material on this thing that I just had dropped because I thought it was too sciency or just, you mm. know. So I think it can just be like bouncing it off people. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, hi, Hillary. Um, as a lucky husband of one of the candidates over here, um, <laughs> uh, I had a question as well. Um, do you have a real well, job? Yes. I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that. I was thinking that. <laughs> so, I was, good for you. Yeah. 
well, basing it off that, uh, um, one thing is that, uh, first off, you just mentioned that um, you bounce off the ideas with, uh, with your spouse or um, your best friend or whoever, and you gauge the interest level from that. Apart from that, what are the other techniques? Well, because I've been subject to that already. So, <laughs> so uh, what are the other techniques that I should be ready for? Or uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, brace yourself, yeah. my friend. <laughs> so, yeah. Self doubt. You're going to deal with a lot right. of that. <laughs> um, which have been proven successful, uh, mostly for for the. Well, so people. so I mean, this is really interesting. So I actually. I haven't been doing this as much lately because my husband's just been super busy, but I, for a long time, for many years, he was always my first reader, mm. and I would not send anything out to an editor, no matter how short, without him reading it. Mm. And, um, you know, there's a certain, like, bedside manner that's helpful when you're reading your partner's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is actually helpful if you're going to be an editor also, but I, you know... It's always good to say, wow, I really liked X <laughs> before wow. you say the thing that you well, didn't like. And you because have you might think, like, oh, well, I can only talk about the things that aren't working because she knows that I think she's like incredibly smart and talented and I don't have to actually say anything. You definitely need to say right. anything. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I'm sure this is true in Dan's house, although there are two writers in his house. This is true in yours. I know that... Um, in, in my house, uh, I like to, I guess is the right word, like to read stories out loud because mm -hmm. I think I can hear them differently and even if my editors or readers don't care, even if it's a really short story, I want, there's some sort of music in there that I strive for because that's one of my rewards, so I like to read it out loud. Works better if I read it out loud to someone, so I'd like to read them out loud to my wife, and she has learned over the years to just kind of listen <laughs> and then maybe the next day, <laughs> say, you know, I was thinking about what you <laughs> I think relationships thrive on, yeah. on totally. air and room. I totally agree. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, um, stifle your desire to improve your work <laughs> a little bit. You know? No, but I do think, I mean, it's but really it's helpful, so I don't, I don't know what you profession is. It's great that you have a job. But um, I, <laughs> I think that it's really helpful to have like a perspective from someone who doesn't know anything about yeah. the thing you're writing about. And yeah. so like my husband is great at give, being a reality check for me and being like, I have no idea what you mean here. Like you're way in the weeds, like using all these terms that you, you know, you only understand because you've been writing about this for a long time. And he's so like, to the extent that you can sort of offer that, that's also really helpful. I read everything out loud before I send it along, but I do it by myself in a room. Um, I pretend I'm like, how would I feel if I was reading this at a reading at a bookstore, and would I be utterly humiliated by this language, and then I know I need to change it? We also expect our spouses to support everything that we do on the page. <laughs> <laughs> I've already, yeah, been subjected to one of those, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just right down here. Thank you. You know, Hillary, I have to say, what you just described is conflict management. <laughs> I once took a class in conflict management, and that's exactly what you teach, and I, and I practice this as an editor. Start with the positive. That end in the, you know, start with the, or the middle is like a constructive criticism and end on a positive. You know, that's exactly what we editors do. And it's really funny when working as a writer, some editor delivers that to me. <laughs> Although I have to say, like, there are a lot of editors who really don't do that. You'd be surprised. Like, it seems like second nature to you, but that's because you're a good editor and there are people who do not. <laughs> my, my question to you, though, is in terms of formula, we were talking before about formula. Every publication does have a formula. You can find it if you really start to like read all of their articles and really look. Like editors have a particular type of story they're looking for, and they tend to default to a formula. So, how much research do you do on a publication mm -hmm. when you're getting ready to write for them? How much reading do you do, and do you like totally dissect a story? What do you, what kind of preparation are you doing? I don't. Um, I mean, I I I know what I have some idea of what they want 
beforehand, right? Or I wouldn't have pitched it to them. And then they, they will, you know, they'll usually say like, okay, well, this is what, you know, I'm envisioning it. So this piece that I'm doing, that's paleontology story, like the editor came back and said, oh, this is so great, and I want it as like a time travel story. A tra think of it as a travel piece, but it's time travel. And so that gave me a kind of, hmm. you know, at least a sort of framework, not necessarily a structure, but it gave me like a framework for thinking about the story, which was super useful. Um, I don't necessarily go, I mean, I certainly like, I would never pitch a magazine without knowing what they've written about this topic and what kinds of stories they do and, and the sort of basic structure that they have. But I don't necessarily read, like I, I, I'll read, like if, I'm, if it's a new publication that I haven't written for before, I'll definitely, before I sit down to write, like read a few issues and just to kind of get myself in the rhythm of the thing. And I think then it, then it's sort of in your head and it comes a little bit more easily. But I don't, I don't, know, I don't know that I think it's a good idea to like try and mimic a structure because, or you know, try and mimic what a magazine is doing. Because I think also they've, you know, they want your voice, right? Like they've assigned a story to you to some degree because they want your voice. And I think they can, like the editor can work with you to sort of, you know, Audubonify it or wiredify it or whatever. Um, yes. Yes, and I think, and for front of the book stuff, yes, definitely. And for front of the book stuff, it really is worth your while to to very much like look at what is there and and mimic it to a certain degree because that's there's a reason why the front of the book stories are structured in a certain way. It's because the magazine wants them that way, and so you should. It's very useful if you do kind of absorb that and mimic it. <laughs> I wish that I had a file folder full of acceptance letters. Of yours or of mine? That I could read to you, <laughs> telling you how great you are, telling you how uh, richly you have rewarded our attention with your expertise, with your experience. Um, I wish I had a box of them. I'd read them all to you right now. <laughs> Thank you. But on behalf of that. the group here, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you.